Okay, hi there. Uh, thanks for uh, waiting around and not just eating food and then going. Uh, so I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to talk about a project uh, that we've done at Gazprom. Uh, it's called the News Analyzer. Um, and hopefully we'll give you some details on some of the challenges we have. It's quite, quite challenging in this market. I think as Chris has pointed out about data and how we consume it. Um, Chris also mentioned about how we can make money from data. But actually, how do we actually process that data, especially when it's millions of sources and we've got big data? So hopefully this will be a good example to understand how we've tried to take on one of those challenges. Um, so a bit about the agenda. Uh, first of all, we'll talk about uh, the uh, problem to be solved. Why are we trying to solve it? What's the importance of solving it? And then we're going to probably break down a bit more into the detail. So we're covering the data, the processing, analytics, uh, notifications, uh, and then hopefully a little bit about the tech stack and you can ask some questions as well. Um, so for myself, uh, I'm also a development team lead. I work in the data and analytics stream. So we have a mixture of Python and .NET developers across uh, both UK offices uh, and two offices over in Russia. Uh, predominantly, we're there to support the traders. So uh, this could be something from execution, pre-execution, as Chris has mentioned, post-execution, so things like, uh, I've done a trade, what happens next? But we also cover analytics, and analytics is the key part for us at the moment. Because as data grows and there's more and more importance on it, it's how do we actually use that data, and that's the key thing. And that's why, as part of our work now, we really look at the modeling of this data. Now, one of the biggest problems we've got at Gazprom, um, Chris has mentioned it, I heard some questions earlier about it, we just have too much data. Um, traders on a day-to-day -day basis, we throw data at them, we've got, I don't know, two or three hundred applications, uh, what else is there? There's probably lots of emails Chris has mentioned about. A trader will get an average about 10,000 emails. There's lots and lots of different sources of data that's coming in. And how as a trader, how do you make a decision? And if the market says, okay, the weather's changed, uh, there's been an incident, there's a problem, how do you make a decision in a few seconds to be able to process that data and actually then make a trading decision? That's very, very difficult. In addition to that, what makes it much more challenging is, is that energy markets themselves are very sensitive. So as soon as a piece of information comes out, the whole market will suddenly trade. That could be the price goes up, the price goes down. It's a very, very fast market. And we can't actually live in these day and age where you read the newspaper, you read a Twitter account. We have to process large volumes of data, and that, that's the biggest challenge for us. Um, so yeah, so some of the problems that we have to try and deal with are geopolitical, uh, natural accidental disasters, uh, weather, which Chris talked about, climate, uh, even the temperature has a big thing, uh, what direction uh, the water flows. So if the water flows in this direction, uh, that has an impact on trading. If the water flows in a different direction, that has an impact on trading. There's a lot of data to take into account. So. The traders came to myself uh, with the problem. Stuart, we've just got too much data. Uh, we're struggling to keep up. Um, other companies are starting to actually produce initiatives to actually get data, process it, make trading decisions off it. And they came to me with some really interesting challenges. So the first one they said was, we need you to read from a million data sources. And I don't know if you worked on any projects where someone gives you a, a requirement of trying to read a million data sources, but it's a lot of data to consume. The other thing is, is that they want to trade signal. So I think Chris is really going to touch on that trade signal element. They want to be notified. They don't care how that data is processed. They just want to get that, and it's a profit and loss scenario. And that's really important to them. And finally, and this is a technical challenge, we have to read, clean, translate from 50 different languages and process that data in less than one second. That's very, very hard, um, but we did achieve it at scale. Um, that, those were the three, three top things we were asked to do. So hopefully I can take you through some of, of the things we did for that. So data, first of all data, Twitter has 550 million tweets a day. That's quite a lot. Uh, we've sat with the guys at Twitter. 
uh, talk through our problem, uh, describe what we're trying to do with it, uh, and they came up with a, a technical solution which really challenged how the way in which we normally program. Typically, I think we've talked about earlier on, is uh, we, we would take some data, we'd use a RabbitMQ, we'd use any kind of Kafka, all these types of technologies, and we'd be able to process data. But if you've got, I don't know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of tweets coming in every second, how do you process that much data? It's a really big challenge. Um, other articles as well, so we want to get from BBC News, uh, Russian Today, Bloomberg, Reuters. The, the, these are more traditional types of uh, news sources. And then the key one here is bespoke sources. So this is uh, a French company that starts a newspaper that only they have news about. And then on the other side of it is, OK, I've, I've got all this data, but it's not in the same format. Um, the frequency is different. So sometimes I get one article, another article, Twitter, it's con continually going on. Uh, I've, I've got varying size of data, so some people are really nice. I get lots of metadata. They tell me about the asset. They tell me about what the different types of things are about it. Others are, there was a problem, and that's it. How do I actually work out that data, sift through it, and understand it properly? Um, so going back to why we want to do this, um, in 2017, um, this is a picture here of rough storage. Uh, this is now closed. Um, what happened was is that uh, rough storage was responsible for storing gas underneath um, the ocean for the UK, and they held most of the gas storage for the whole of the UK. And typically, with the trading markets, what they would do is they would put most of, most of their assets into there because it was seen as a safe thing that could happen. Well, what happened was is that in 2017, a maintenance report came out saying that there were some cracks within the storage system and that gas was starting to leak out. Within 10 minutes, they found out that most of the storage um, that was being used was not safe to pump out because obviously traders have these. They want to get rid of the gas, move it away from the assets as, as quick as they can. And then the other problem we noticed as well was reports and news were coming in very, very slowly. So most energy markets, they pay quite a lot of money for the Reuters and the Bloomberg, but we weren't getting their news quick enough. And th the problem there is, is that we have statements like this. Closure of UK's largest gas storage site can mean volatile prices. Five billion cubic meters of gas loss in one day. Th these are huge numbers, and th this is such a significant asset to um, any energy industry. But more importantly was that some energy companies knew more about what was going on than others. And we can see that in the market and the way in which people trade. And so this is why we were interested in it. We want to say, why are other companies better at us than doing this? So in terms of trying to solve the problem, we really need to understand what the problem is. We, we've used Reuters, Bloomberg as, as examples, but we have many, many different sources. Um, the commodity markets seem to be using other sources of data that we're not aware of. So part of it is about analysis. How do we actually find out what data is being used? And we came to the conclusion it's more of the non-traditional news outlets. Uh, the second problem is how do we consume so much data? And the third one, and I come back to that, is how do we process something within one second? That's very difficult. So to break the problem down, I've broken it down quite simply here. I, I won't show you any code today um, for obvious reasons, but um, we break it down into reading the data, process the data, analyze the data, and then notification. So I get a piece of news in, I process it, I analyze it, I look at it, is this good, is this bad? And then I need to notify and make a decision that is this good uh, in terms of what the trader wants? Or is this just interesting facts, but actually has nothing to do with trading? So it's very difficult, but very interesting, I think. So first off, I cover the reading data problem. So we've got multiple formats. We've got multiple languages. Um, the data has to be really quick. Now, in our case, what we did was we used the Microsoft, uh, microservice uh, technology to scale, scale here. Um, that is to say that for each service that we have, it has a specific goal, very tiny operation, and we scale up quite a lot for that. Okay. So the other problem as well, as you can see here, we have JSON, RSS, YAML, HTML, text, 
with lots of different formats. And again, one of the challenges that we had to try and solve was how, how do we actually process and, and, I don't know, how can I say, maybe put it all together. Uh, it's, very, it's very, very difficult. So we came up with this architecture here, um, which was a listener microservice. Um, the listener microservice itself was able to process just one job, one fact about the thing, and pass, pass on the message to the next thing. We used a mixture of uh, cloud technology, mainly uh, .NET, but a bit of Python in there as well. And importantly, we had to monitor the frequency um, of each micro listener. Data processing is probably more interesting than reading data. Um, how do we translate it? How do we treat it? How do we clean it? These are really, really important things. Um, so when it comes to tweets, one of, the, one of the biggest problems we had with Twitter data was uh, someone retweets the same data, and they retweet the same data, and they continue doing this. And the problem is, is what do you do? Do you get that first piece of data, analyze it, say it's good, and get the second piece of data, say it's good again? No, you need a way in which you can actually filter out that data, clean out that data, and you have to use different types of techniques for this. The other one is translation. That is probably one of the most difficult things, I would say. We can translate common words, we can translate common sentences, but if there's a colloquial term that you only know in your language, if I translate that to English, it might not come out the same way. So how do we translate what you would describe in one language into another language and then try to make sense of it all? It's a very difficult challenge. The other one as well is that we want to use uh, formatting of data. We want to standardize it. So I've got YAML, I've got HTML, I've got XML, all these different formats. But actually, what I really want is I want one data set which can actually, I can then analyze and look at. And that's, that's the key part to this. And then at the bottom here is I want to, I want to use some machine learning. But I don't want to use it because it's fun, although sometimes I must admit it is quite fun. Um, I actually want to use it for some value here. And so in our case, what we did was we were looking at key phrase analysis, and that's really, really crucial. So in a sentence, it's not so much about what the key words are, although they're really important. It's the phrases, it's the, the percentage of each word uh, related to its sentence that's the most important part. That's very, very key as well. So I have an example, again, not with code. So if we take the original up here, which I hope my Russian is good, I apologize if it's bad up front. Um, when, when we translate this to English, this comes through as uh, a flammable, a flammable uh, power, power plant is on fire now, uh, watches out for it. So the first thing we've done there is we've translated it. Um, but I know that this is not uh, a correct sentence. So the first thing we do is we actually take that sentence there and we apply uh, lamentization and stopping words. So to, to describe what those mean, that means if someone says cars or trucks or something else, I might want to ch change that to say vehicle. If someone actually uses the word cars over cars, the car over cars, I might want to shorten that word because if I've got 10 different cars, cars, da -da -da -da, vehicles, how do I know what it's describing? And when I look later on, as we'll go into, how do I then determine through entities and categorization, how do I determine what that entity is if I've got four abbreviations for the same word? So the lemmatization, the stopping, is all about trying to shorten down those words, um, trying to clean the data up as much as we can. Once we've done that, um, this is the part I was talking about, which is to create a record. How do we standardize that data? So we have some raw data, we have some conversions to it, um, but also we've got one format, and that, that's very crucial. The next part is to perform some machine learning. So if we look at the top sentence there, we've got a flammable power plant that's on fire now, watches out or watch out for it. What we've got is some facts. We've got there's a fire, there's a power plant that's on fire, it's telling me to watch now, and it's flammable. Now, I know that Flammerville is a power plant uh, in France. It's a nuclear power station. Um, and it's very interesting that that's on fire because for traders, they want to know about this. But 
how do I then tell a program that that's what a trader's interested in? That's also a very difficult point. So the first thing we do is to, after we've performed some machine learning um, and we've looked at key phrase analysis, we then need to start to clean down those keywords. We need to start categorizing that data and that's really difficult unless you've spent a lot of time uh, using a lot of software tools or, guess what, third party libraries. Um, and that's what we've done here. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. There are really smart people out here who have solved this problem, so why don't we let some people do it? Okay. So I've taken a small slice of a very large diagram that we have here. Um, you may not be able to see fully the, uh, the text on that, um, but hopefully what this will do is to show you just, just taking two types, Twitter and RSS, uh, how many stages that we have to go through. Uh, I've talked about uh, lemmatization and stemming, uh, but we have so many other steps that need to go through. But this is all part of the process of trying to categorize your data and trying to understand it. Okay. Now, in terms of what we've used for that set of technologies, uh, we've used the Yandex la language translation tool. Uh, it was phenomenal. It was one of the fastest um, language translation tools out there. In my opinion, it, be, it beats some of the much larger companies in, in their speed and perhaps costs a little bit less. Um, the tagging and the entity detection and lemmatization, so this is the car, cars kind of scenario. Uh, we use the uh, core natural language programming uh, from Stanford University. It's a fantastic product, so I'd highly recommend having a look at it. Um, it it's phenomenal what they can do. Uh, we also used a bit of Microsoft, so for some of the machine learning that I talked about earlier, we use cognitive services, so this is looking at key phrase analysis. And uh, just a small call out to TweetSharp, um, there's many out there at the moment, uh, but we found this to be a very, very good way of integrating and getting quick results for Twitter data. Plug in a .NET library and you're up and running very quickly. It's really, really intuitive, um, so I just thought I'd shut that one out. Okay, so, so now we want to analyze it. So we, we've read it, we've sort of said some facts about the data, but now we want to try and t turn it into something else. So one of the things that we had to do, or what we realized early on, was no one solution was the right way to do it. We had to actually mix a series of different solutions to make this work. Um, so for example, sentiment analysis. Is something good or is something bad? Well, that's very subjective because yes, it might be good that uh, a country has elected this president, but it might not mean that it's very good because the price of energy uh, goes down or goes up as well. Um, there's more layers of, of information that you need to make a decision on. And all of this we have to try and do again, as I repeat, in one second. Very difficult. So some of the techniques we've used is NLP, so that's natural language processing, uh, machine learning, uh, supervised learning, and then also some categorizations as well. So yeah, some of the problems we had. Everyone's heard of fake news, I imagine. Um, you know, is it really truthful? Uh, this came, probably the announcement of fake news came six months into the project, which uh, for anyone that's writing software like this is very difficult because now you have to see whether your data is tr truthful or you can trust it. Um, what are the patterns within the data? So if one person says there's a big problem and a hundred people say there's not a big problem, how do you work out who's setting the truth? It could be that one person or it could be the people, a hundred people there. So that's, that was a very difficult thing. Um, the other one as well that we found was that, uh, and we found this especially in Twitter, is, is that people in Twitter have a very big different opinion to energy traders. And it was one of the most difficult things because we thought we'd solved it very quickly and actually we found that that was one of the biggest issues uh, to try and do. And I think Chris had mentioned about backtesting before, um, when we pull back this data, it's not a couple of millions of records, it's 550 million records from Twitter and so on and so forth. How do we store that capacity? So that, that was another challenge we had on this. 
So in terms of the solution for this, uh, as I said, we had to use multiple techniques. So the first thing was is that in our data preparation, we had to actually inject our own data. So one of them was the metadata. So this is things like uh, facts about information. So if you've got one source that's got tons of metadata, another source that's got very little, you might need to inject it with more metadata to try and get some balance between the two news sources. Um, the other part as well was keyword analysis. Uh, keywords are really impo important to us. Uh, known assets, people, historical data, lots of different facts that make it up. It's very, very challenging if you just kind of take it on face value for that sentence. You need to build up some data. Now, once we've prepared that data, we then need to analyze it. And in terms of the analysis, the, the key thing here was to um, do our back testing, as we talked about before, but also one of the crucial ones was the, the cross-pattern analysis. And the reason for that was is that we want to take one technique and see if that works. We want to take another technique, see if that works, take another technique, and then bundle them up together and see if all three techniques come out with a different solution than the individual parts. Um, that was really, really crucial for this. Finally, uh, we've done all of this processing, we've done all this analysis, but is it good? Is the news item itself actually of any value? We've still got to make that decision. And so in this case here, sometimes it was just no. It was wasted time, but we know it's not good. Um, and also, importantly, is, is it related to trading, specifically in the things that we're interested in? And that comes from the data preparation. So we do have a list of assets. We have a list of people. Um, it's really crucial that we match it to that. Um, so in terms of our analysis, I don't know if that's come out too well. Um, but what we can see is that we've got three layers that we would treat the data with. So the first one is a basic one. We, we build up taxonomies, uh, key phrases, uh, matching of words, these types of simple things. The next stage is actually trying to analyze it and say, OK, does this news say it's a disaster? Is this a political message? Um, is it environmental? All these different types of things we need to determine. Because in the background, what we're trying to do is trying to say, OK, well, if it's a high percentage of news and it's a high percentage of disaster, that could be a high probability there's a likelihood that this is related to a disaster. So we want to tell the traders as soon as we can about this. But if those are down in one area, we don't want to tell them about it. And then overall, we have our overall score rating. And this is just a, simply a percentage to say, we think overall, this is how important it would be to a trader. And if it hits that certain level, then we'd send it to them. So in this example here, um, we've got on the left here, 10 key words that match. The machine learning is coming back with over 75%. And in our case, they mentioned about Flammerville. So therefore, uh, they mentioned that was great, fantastic. We'll notify the trader. On the other side, we have one keyword that was matched. Uh, there were swear words. Uh, I won't go into too much about how swear words have affected things, but uh, there's been some interesting days where traders have received some interesting uh, tweets. Uh, and the machine learning was really, really low. So in this case, we've made a decision uh, to ignore it. And we won't actually give it to the trader. OK, cool. So hopefully that covers that part. Um, now, notifications. Uh, I think Chris mentioned before, in a trading world, email is probably the most uh, important tool for traders. Um, the, di the difficulty is they get a lot of them. And the other thing is, is that with all this data, if, if I've got 550 million matches, which is probably impossible, but it could be possible, how do I then send 550 million emails to a trader and say, by the way, this is all the results? It, it, again, it poses another challenge. And that's why when we're looking at the analysis and breaking down those problems, that's where the duplication comes in. That's, that's what's important. You know, it, are there patterns in the data that can group this section of data together that actually say one thing about one fact? It's really, really important. So in our case, um, what we have is we have some very simple things. We retrieve the results. Uh, we prepare it. We'll send an email out. We'll send a notification and we'll consume, consume the trader feedback. And again, this is one of the really important things uh, and final po points of this is it's not good enough to then say, okay, 
uh, I've told you the news is good. We now need to know what they think of our results. So as you can see on here, we've got the importance here, um, a picture of it, if it was there. We typically, uh, mo most of the data that we have, uh, we have geotags, so this can tell you whereabouts in the world this is happening. Um, we have the original translation. Uh, we also tell the trader exactly what the, the type of data that it's related to is. Um, so in this case here, it was a disaster. Um, and we build up a whole series of facts. And, and the, the key part to it for a trader's perspective is to keep it simple. If you throw lots of information at them, they're not going to understand. But if they see a few colors and they look at the green one and the green one tells them what the strength of this news is, they're more interested in quickly reading that and making the decision. Okay, so I talked about feedback. One of the things that we had when we first launched the, the system was that people, traders specifically, said, I don't agree with this. I think that's wrong. I don't think that's correct either. And so we were like, okay, well, how, how, are we so, how do we solve this? How do we do it in an automatic way? And so we came up with these uh, three uh, groups of or notification ways uh, that a trader could actually tell us. And so we built a very tiny application. They would receive all of their new system uh, alerts in there. And then they could actually feed back and say, yes, this is good, I traded on it. It was okay, not too bad. Um, or it's not good at all. What we then did was we then made an adjustment to all of our score weighting. So we took each word, each political related thing, each person, each asset, and then we actually scaled down that number based on that particular trader's feedback. And then we applied this over a series of times. We then started to use a bit of a neural network in there and starting to see patterns in the behavior of traders. And very interestingly, was it was completely opposite to what we expected. What they really were interested in um, was, is there a disaster? Can I make money? Can I, how am I going to not lose money? I've got my assets here. How do I keep them safe? All these kind of facts came out. Rather than, there's a big problem. You need to look at it. It's very, very interesting. Um, but importantly here is, is that we're able to tailor the application, not just deliver the application out there, but tailor the application to actually work and be a self-service for traders themselves, which I think was a really, really nice feature. So in terms of the .NET libraries that we used for this part, um, we use the .NET standard core. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we've started to experiment a bit with ML.NET. So I don't know if anyone's used that just yet, um, but it's a very good one to have a look at. I'd really encourage you to have a look at it. It's really, really good. Um, it, it's got some good promise on it. Um, I don't know how far the AI side of it is coming, um, but the machine learning part has been something that I found really interesting. Uh, cool, okay, so just to wrap this up then, so reading the news programmatically, I've probably kept it quite high level for this, but effectively it's, it's quite a challenge. But one of the good things here is, is that we've, we've been able to enjoy this project in the amount of challenges it's had. How do we get data in? How do we solve big data problems? How do we analyze that data? How do we solve other issues? How do people feel about it? Is sentiment good? How do we process millions of records per second? There are lots of fun, interesting things about this project. Um, and we hope to continue further on that. Uh, I'd also make a call out to the cloud technology. Um, so we used a lot of cloud for this. One of the good things with it was just the scalability of things were phenomenal. Um, it really helped, especially in our microservice architecture, to scale that up very quickly. And the, I'd say the machine learning and the AI side of things is, is coming on leaps and bounds these days, uh, especially in the cloud. And more often than not, I notice that there's more competition about who's going to use their tool rather than applying the right tool for it. It's a very interesting market. Um, and then finally, I'll just say that uh, machine learning is a subset of AI. But what I've just told you, was that really AI? Was it artificial intelligence? Um, and that, that, that's probably where we're now sort of hearing about AI and we're hearing its values. Machine learning is part of AI. But trying to understand that is 
something I don't know if we're quite there yet, but it's something I think we'll be looking at in the future. Um, so I, I think that's something to watch. In terms of our tech stack, so we've used quite similar things, I think, as Chris has mentioned before. Uh, the other ones I'd probably call out is, uh, yeah, Azure, a bit of Docker, Azure Machine Learning, and Yandex. Um, they really, really have helped us um, to propel us on this. Uh, we found that .NET was really powerful uh, in this. Uh, at early stages, we started off trialing with other languages. And one of the key things, and Chris has touched upon it, and I'm really happy he did, was um, you should always use the right software language for, to solve the right problem. Um, too often, more, more often than not, what happens is, as we say, we're this kind of developer or we're that kind of developer, and we'll just use those tools. And my advice is, is try to use the right language for the right problem. Um, we wouldn't have been able to solve this in Python. Definitely not. Um, so in this case, .NET was really, really uh, powerful for us. Um, and I just, just want to call that one out. Now, if I break down the programming languages that we used across three core parts of it, um, we did have a bit of Python in there, but majority of it, it was .NET on the analytics learning side. The data processing um, was nothing at all. It was purely .NET. Um, and then in terms of our uh, software applications that we developed in-house, um, again, the majority of it is .NET. Um, very little on the Python side. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll skip past that. Um, so any questions at all? <laughs> I, I was gauging the tired faces. <laughs> OK, so uh, I've, th this diagram effectively just covers uh, how we're listening for the, uh, the data that comes in. Um, we then go through a process of cleaning and treating that data. We then apply uh, machine learning. So this is the keyword analysis. And uh, in our case, we, we went and used the machine learning from Azure. Uh, then we notify. Uh, we send out email notifications, uh, as well as the software tool I mentioned about. And then finally, we get that feedback that comes back in and tells, tells the system, OK, well, um, this isn't as good news as you thought it was. Change your weighting of your scores so that it can recalculate that for the next item that comes in. <coughs> yeah? Cool. Great. OK. That's it. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, you may ask that. <laughs> Without a microphone, <laughs> it's a minute later. Okay. Thank you very much. It's been very interesting. Uh, I'm a debate developer, and cool. I'm curious about what's the role of a SQL Server. So the, the SQL Server, very good question. Um, the role of SQL Server, particularly in there, um, was uh, in the Twitter area. So we had a lot of streaming processes, data streaming processes. Um, but I don't know if you saw at one point when I talked about we've always got to get the data into one particular thing. Um, so we used the in-memory optimization table, memory optimized tables. Um, we actually got found it to be really fast at memory caching data, um, saving it down. And then we could actually then uh, continue the journey with the data. So that goes through all the different stages of the processing, the analysis, et cetera. And then when it gets to the end of it, the data that's stored within SQL becomes an archived set of data. And that becomes our back testing to see, OK, well, historically, uh, all, these, all this data came in. I, I'm going to change my scaling of it. How does it have an impact on my back testing? So that mainly it was just the back testing side of things so that we could have some storage of the data. Perfect. Okay, anybody else? If not, then let's say thank you again. Mr.